Hey guys, it's April 1st, 2018, and this is your episode 139 of At Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me as usual are my co-hosts, Megan Arns. Hello. And Laurel Black. Hi. Ben Charles, how's it going? Hey everybody, doing well? And you guys are guests today. We have a guest percussion quartet with us. They've been called, quote, nothing short of remarkable and the most exciting most exciting addition to Madison's classical music scene. They're from Madison, Wisconsin, and they bring to us new music from living composers, classical repertoire from the 20th century, and experimental sounds with handmade instruments. They seek to inspire new audiences, educate people within the percussive and musical arts, and generate meaningful, lasting collaborations with composers and other artists. So hello and welcome to the Clocks in Motion Percussion Quartet. How's it going, guys? Very great. great. Thanks. Going great. Thanks for having us. That was like a perfect in unison going great. You guys clearly <laughs> did on song. <ensemble. laughs> Must be rehearsing right now. <laughs> yeah. so do me a quick favor and just introduce yourself so we can connect a voice with a name. Hi, I'm Andrew Veit. Hey guys, I'm Matthew Coley. Hello everyone, I'm Chris Jones. And Sean Cleave. Cool, yeah, perfect, thanks so much. So please tell me that you guys, it's it's so great you're together right now, and whenever we have a, a quartet or a duo or an ensemble on, it seems like they always live in different cities, and we end up talking about this. How do you rehearse together when you live in different places? But I would love to hear that you guys actually like live in the same place. Is that true? No. no. <laughs> yeah. Not at all. That's what I thought. Dang it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> this is a lucky circumstance that we're all in the same place right now. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I have a rehearsal space uh, in Wanakee, Wisconsin, which is 20 minutes north of Madison. And uh, we get together on a uh, on a need need based basis in person to rehearse where we have our uh, instruments in our facilities Matthew travels in from Iowa Andrew travels in from Chicago so that's pretty close it's a couple hours drive uh, and Chris is kind of all over the place he was in New York for a while and now he's in what Arkansas Arkansas, Arkansas. yeah, yeah. and so uh, so he flies in um, and so we're going on tour this uh, we're going on tour this next week. And so we're just spending some time in the space, getting our music learned and cleaning everything up. Yeah. And so yeah, a big great. part of that tour, or part of it's in Western Michigan, right? Or what, where are your tour stops? Yeah, Western Michigan is, uh, we have a residency there um, okay. for a couple of days. And then we're doing a, a show in Ann Arbor um, later in the week. Cool. Very cool. And Chris, are you doing a sabbatical replacement right now? Yeah, I'm currently a visiting professor at the University of Central Arkansas for Blake Tyson this semester. Oh, very neat. Very neat. Well, yeah, tell us just a little bit maybe what you guys are rehearsing today and what's going to happen on this tour. Well, yeah, like we were, this morning we were just rehearsing a pretty unique part of our, our uh, repertoire. It's a percussion quartet with a string dulcimer, and uh, our soloist in the dulcimer is actually Matthew. Yeah, this is a part of our rep that we've sort of made it our one of our unique um, calling cards, I guess, where we take on some Eastern European folk music, some Middle Eastern folk music, and we've I've done some arrangements for uh, three keyboard percussion plus dulcimer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a little hand percussion in there. Yeah, this is hand well, drums. Yeah. So, uh, so we're do we always. For the past two years, we always have a set of, I don't know, maybe about 15, 20 minutes of music on our programs that uh, that includes the dulcimer. Uh, kind of a fun addition to our programs, a lot of fan favorites. And yeah. uh, and then we do probably some more classic pieces that everybody's familiar with. Like we've, we've been doing Malin Quartet, the Steve Reich, but uh, this concert, we're actually not doing it. We're replacing it with, uh, we commissioned a new Malin Quartet by um, Andrew Ringflesh, who's a uh, composition faculty at Cleveland State University, called Atomic Atomic. This will be our second performance of it, right? Or the third performance of it. Third, yeah. Third, yeah. Third. yeah, we premiered it last April at Cleveland State. Um, it's really a wonderful piece. Um, and yeah, just some other pieces. You know, we do like third construction, and, and um, I don't know what else. We're adding too. Mechanical Ballet by Anders Koppel. And um, the drums of winter. Right? Yeah, yeah John Luther Adams. Sure. Yeah, we've done the. Yeah, we've done a few of those. That's, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know some of those tunes. <laughs> I've heard some of those tunes. Yeah. Great songs. Yeah, really. 
so so we do the drums of winter. Laurel and I had did the bass drum parts, but when and I saw y'all's recording, it's man, it's, it sounds excellent. Laurel and I did the bass drums like three feet above our our head at the end, just so it would be just yeah, it was so much fun to play. <laughs> Such a great piece. I love that piece. That's really cool. Yeah. Have you guys done the? Uh, have you guys ever played the complete Earth in the Great Weather? That's I, I programmed it with clocks in 2013. But you need a string quartet and a chorus and live looping and all kinds of stuff. It's like a 90 minute ordeal, and the, the three drum movements are kind of dispersed in there. So uh, it's like it's, these huge loud pillars of sound, you know? I, I haven't ever done all of it. Is Dust into Dust one of those drum movements, or is that part of a different set? No, it's a different one. Uh, okay. it's, uh, it's, so it's Drums of Winter, of course, and then there's a really long drum movement. It's like 12 or 13 minutes called Drums of Thunder, mm -hmm. I think is what it's called. And then there's Drums of Fire, Drums of Stone, which is the same movement. It's exactly the same as Drums of Winter in Retrograde. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. So it starts it's with the fast the bongo and then ends with the rolls at the end. Yeah, it's really... Oh, very nice. Cool. warmed up, you know? Yeah. Great. Yeah, of yeah. course. The string, the, string, uh, the strings and chorus movements are, like, really ethereal and quiet, and there's, like, spoken Inuit text over it. It's a really incredible piece. Kind of puts you in a space, you know? Yeah, sure. And and Very any cool. per percussionist listening who would be interested in the drum movements, you can buy the complete piece, but then you can also buy just the drum movements. They sell separate. Yeah, the complete piece is for rental only, but it's actually a pretty decent, like, you get a good product for it, which sure. is not the case with rentals. Um, but you need a really good recording engineer to put it together because there's, like, 32-second loops and stuff. It's really uh, it's complicated to do it in, 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 in person. Very cool. Ben, what did you have there? Well, I had a question. Actually, in like 2010 or so, uh, when I was a student at the University of Illinois, I drove up to Chicago to see Matt Coley do a recital, and he played mostly marimba, but I remember you played some dulcimer, and I was wondering how you got into that, and I know Christopher Dean plays yeah. dulcimer. Did you study with him at all, or what's the deal with the dulcimer? Uh, uh, what, was this at a church? Was yeah, it was or... like there were like five people there, I remember. <laughs> Yeah. I think you meant to say 50. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was like 500 people. I think my mic cut out, but it was bad. <laughs> But I drove like, like two hours to like... see it, so. Um, well, thanks for coming to that, Ben. Um, so yeah, actually, it was Christopher Dean that that sort of turned me on to this this world um, of dulcimer playing. I never, the, but the ironic thing is, I never saw him play. I we just talked a lot about it in our lessons. I studied with Chris in at East Carolina, and then when I transferred to North Texas, I he came later and studied with him again. Um, and he gave me recordings and uh, some of, some recordings of him and then some other people. But yeah, so I just got turned on in, into it that way. And um, there's some pieces by George Crumb that involve the dulcimer. And I had the f fortune of playing one of those called Quest uh, when I went to Northwestern for my master's. And it just so happened they were looking for uh, someone who could play dulcimer and the percussion part. And kind of raised my hand. I was like, actually, I can do that. So <laughs> yeah, um, they were a little bit besides themselves, where they're going to find a dulcimer player. But that's sort of how it began. Um, and then over the years, I've just kind of continued to weave it into my my shtick or the thing that I do. Um, now I'm sort of mostly doing uh, folk music from Eastern Europe and um, and kind of this Middle Eastern tunes. And we're just sort of creating a fusion sound between western percussion and and the traditional instrument it's funny for me because i studied with actually two dulcimer players mr dean is one and bill mersh also plays dulcimer i didn't study yeah. dulcimer with them but i studied with them percussion and bill mersh had a great story about uh one time he's one of the, he said he's one of the few people that can actually read and play dulcimer like you know at the same time sight read and so he got booked for a recording session for an Irish Spring soap commercial, and he said he was trying to talk his way out of it, so he asked for, like, 
double or triple or something like that, and they gave it to him. So he's like, well, shoot, now I have to do this. And yeah, I think he said it was like four multi-track dulcimer parts, and so he asked for him ahead of time to practice it, and by the time he got there, they had actually reworked it, and there was barely any dulcimer, and he got paid four times for it. So yeah, it's those weird skills. You never know when, when it'll be profitable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that's um, actually being able to read and play the instrument has come and uh, worked in my favor as well. Not that well, but but just being able to take on a lot some gigs at the last minute because I could read. Because a lot of tr um, American dulcimer players don't read uh, standard notation. Um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. it's worked out. I have, a, <laughs> sometimes. I, have, I have a pretty ignorant question. Is dulcimer to symbolum? like say marimba is to vibraphone uh no are they more uh, different so, than that so i guess a, a cymbal um, is a type of dulcimer oh. um, and it's a, all in the zither family the cymbal um is just a traditional hungarian uh dulcimer basically uh and uh it's it's quite a bit bigger the strings are arranged differently um, and it's it's built so that it will project in large ensembles and or orchestral style ensembles. Uh, the American Appalachian hammered dulcimer is um, kind of a thinner sound. The strings are thinner. The strings are arranged differently. The, the hammers are smaller, and um, the pedaling is actually reversed from the cymbalum. So, so there's those differences, but they're they're all in the same family, and all the strings are, you know, either wound wire or um, like a steel single or um, steel or kind of a bronze wire. If anyone's wondering what the hell we're talking about here, and you'd like to hear a piece that has symbol, <laughs> of course, Harry Yano Suite has a big symbol in part, but also uh, Igor Stravinsky has a piece called Ragtime for Eleven Instruments. And it's for flute, clarinet, horn, trumpet, trombone, percussion, which it's sort of a proto soldier's tale percussion part, cymbalum, first, second violin, viola, and contrabass. Um, and I've actually I've gotten to conduct that work, but we didn't have a cymbalum; we just did it on piano. But yeah, if you're interested for the sound of this instrument, apparently Stravinsky was a big fan, and I think owned a cymbalum. And yeah. Well, and I know yeah. there's cymbalum in like Boulez, and. Yeah. Yeah. Kurtog. I, 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 yeah. Oh, one more time, Matt. Sorry. Kurtog. That's oh, okay. And Kurtog also. Uh, George, 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 George. Yeah, yeah. George Kurtog and um, Bartok wrote for it, and it's first Rhapsody. So, c could you, or have you been? Have, do you have any interest in, or would it be possible? Like, oh, okay, I can also take a symbolum gig. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I own a symbolum, and and I, I've got um, in a couple months. I'm playing the Bartok First Rhapsody with an orchestra. Cool. Okay. Next year I'm going to do Harianos, and um, I think the Bartok again. Um, but have you guys seen my video of the ragtime with marimba, symbolum, and percussion? I, I saw you that. playing symbolum on something, but I don't know if it was that. So I, I have a, I do an arrangement of the, the Stravinsky ragtime that Ben was talking about for uh -huh. solo marimba. Which I've seen I you do that in marimba solo. Yeah. So I recorded myself doing both parts, and then the percussionist in that was also the videographer, and he he put it all together. So it looks like a trio. It looks like me me and my my clone playing the two parts <laughs> with with the percussionist. Wow! Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ben, I didn't hear it like that. <laughs> I had a friend in school it. that said that. We can't say it on air what I just wrote, but it was really funny to anyone that's listening. We can say whatever we want. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, let me no let me give these yet. guys a a a quick break. This should be a pretty short what's the sound for you actually, but I bumped into this and, and I'll give you a little hint. It is Henry Cowell and Chopin is the hint. It's not a very good hint, but it's uh, it's what I got. So see if you can guess what the sound is, or if you know, please tell us. Am I taking comps again? <laughs> the quiz, right? <laughs> or the audience? Yeah, isn't this fun? See how fun this is? <laughs>
any anyone happened to have heard something like that before? Microphony. <laughs> 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 I thought I had to pick a harder one because the the last couple of guests have or one of you guys has been able to guess my my sound so I had to pick something a little more abstract but this is something called a aeolian harp uh, also known as a wind harp or a harmonic harp or a spirit harp but most common is aeolian harp or wind harp this particular one is a very big Aeolian harp, and it's an art installation created by artist Douglas Hollis in 1976. It stands 27 feet high and currently sits at Pier 15 in San Francisco. So what this looks like is basically like a big tennis racket almost up in the air, and they can be arranged in many, many different ways, but the point is you have a bunch of cables or strings set up to catch the air, and I'll insert a little picture for everyone to see as well as send you guys a little picture so you know what I'm talking about. So it just depends on how the wind is blowing, sort of? Sort of. So it's a, a, a bunch of different factors, it sounds like. Like, I think you would, you would tune it, I assume, based on the strength of the wind you expect. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, going on here just a little bit. The cables are stretched in an open space to catch the wind. The wind causes the strings to vibrate, of course, and by a process called vortex sh shedding, or also known as the Carmen Vortex Street. This just means the cables are disrupting the wind flow just right so that they oscillate behind the string. So the wind is broken and it causes a, 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 a movement behind the string and thus the string vibrates. So, and this interesting enough, the physics behind this wasn't solved until 1915. They just thought it was kind of mysterious how the sound was made or why it only responded in harmonics. So the cables are also connected to horns low on the ground to amplify the harmonic frequencies. So like Megan asked, the quality of the sound depends on many factors, including the lengths, gauges, and types of strings, the type of wind. So I guess they're, they're referring to, you know, is it gusty? Is it going steady? Is it accelerating? Uh, you know, what's the nature of the wind? And also, of course, the material of the resonating bodies that the strings are tethered to. Metal framed instruments with no soundboard produce music very different from ones uh, that are, say, in wooden boxes. So it's a very old instrument. It was first described in the 17th century and became popular in the 18th century. Traditional wind harps are much smaller and far simpler than the one I played for you. Basically, the strings are just stretched across a wooden box and would be placed in a window seal. You can see these photos if you look up Aeolian harp or wind harp. You can see like in a castle window, they'll have this ornate little metal decorative thing with some strings, and that's a wind harp. So huh. I said your hint was Henry Cowell and Frederick Chopin. So that's because they both have pieces that have been called Aeolian harp. So Henry Cowell has one Aeolian harp written in 1923. And it's one of the first piano pieces to feature extended techniques on the piano, including things like plucking and sweeping across the strings and stuff like that. The Chopin wasn't originally called that, but it's something Schumann, Robert Schumann, gave the nickname to. So there's nothing really that sounds like this about any Chopin, in my opinion. That's cool. I don't remember seeing that. Has have any of you seen? seen that in person in San Francisco? No, what, uh, Casey, what pier did you say it was on? I'm actually going to... This says it's on Pier 15. I'm going to see it. I'm going to San Francisco in a few months. I'm going to... my way here. So have you guys seen... Uh, the, I think it's like the water organ. It's in San yeah, Francisco. That's, I was going to mention that. It's in Croatia. Uh, it's called the Sea Organ. I just looked up. And it's there are several. Yeah, well, it's basically the this famous one in Croatia. It's like at a like at a dock, and I just looked it up on Wikipedia, um, and it says the device was made by the architect Nikola Basic as part of the project to redesign the new city coast. Yada yada yada. The waves interact with the organ in order to create somewhat random but harmonic sounds. So, but yeah, it's the same sort of like natural mm -hmm. instrument and it's yeah it's like a big dock with you know all these tubes underneath it the, the waste screen the, the, the cool thing about you mentioning that and and matt mentioning the one in california is they're they're both wave organs and they sound really different i checked those out too that was maybe going to be a future what's the sound but 
Not so much. Not yet. anymore. Yeah, oh, man. If anyone's yeah. watching, you gotta wait like thirty more podcasts before you can bring it back. You know, thirty more. If anyone yeah, watches yeah. Uh, the Grand Tour on Amazon Prime, they have the sea organ on there. Yes. Uh, yep. I, I thought it was interesting. These were popular when they were, like in the 1600s. When I don't know, I, I feel like people were so still so superstitious about. <laughs> and like the, the you you look up plenty of videos with these organs being, or excuse me, these harps being played by the wind. They all mostly sound like the one I played for you. I mean, the one I played for you has a lot of harmonic overtones and is pretty dissonant. But none of them exactly sound like Chopin. Like I don't know where, <laughs> where, where that came from. Definitely sounds like Henry Cowell, but I I don't get the the nickname from Robert Schumann there. And I've listened to that Chopin, thinking like, okay, can I can I catch some of this? Maybe I have more to say there, but I I just don't. They sound so different. But the actual Cowell piece entitled Alien Harp, I don't think sounds much like that. That's I, but I, banshee, right? I mean. It's like, yeah, agree, agree. But I think he's at least, you can tell he's at least inspired by yeah. like the overtones. Like if you open a piano and you start plucking strings and you start muting and you start doing all that George Crumb stuff, you get a lot of those same howls and, and spooky metal sounds, you know? Yeah. But yeah. you're right. Like there is no, yeah, there is no. That, like, that particular piece though, Alien Harp is like very beautiful and like it's it's just kind of the alien scale or something, you know, I don't know. Um, sure. Yeah. yeah, sure, sure, sure. So yeah, I, I don't know. Like maybe they may, maybe they sounded very different once, or people would tune them very differently. And it seems like th you do see configurations of them where you have one set of strings here, and another set of strings there, and they surround a box. So it seems like it'd be very easy to tune them such that you at least get a you know some kind of consonant chord humming out of it or something. So mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah, you, you, I'm sure you're right. Well, I'm, I'm going to keep a lookout for that thing next time we go to San Francisco. Okay, here we go. We have got a Facebook question. Right. Um, I'm sorry if I um, pronounced this person's name wrong, but Tanea Jovial Fabre, it says, Hi, Dr. Coley and Sean. How has balancing group endeavors and personal endeavors been? What's the most difficult thing you all have had to deal with as an ensemble? Oh. <laughs> Well, loaded question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You want to take that? We can probably, we can probably take some turns yeah, answering yeah, yeah. Um, So the first part is balancing work life and kind of uh, personal life. So I, the our group, um, the last time we were together performing was last April. And the reason we took some time off is because of personal life issues. I, I uh, My wife and I just had a baby uh, in September. And so we just took a little time off as a group in order to, uh, you know, deal with that enormous life change. Uh, we all have different kind of life situations, but uh, it's kind of nice because we're kind of creating our own path here as a percussion quartet. Like we don't, we don't have a boss other than ourselves. So as far as balancing clocks in motion, it's pretty easy because we have a general uh, agreement as a performer agreement that says that we don't, we're not doing any projects that we don't feel unanimously committed to. So uh, it's pretty easy. Like if there's even a, a little bit of an on the fence thing, like we had some concerts planned in the fall. Uh, I think it was what, October or November yeah. or something. And there was a little bit of hesitation from like two members. I, and, I, and I was one of them. And we just kind of had a conversation and just had to say, you know what, we got to we got to cancel these shows. Like it's just not going to be right for us. So um, but now we're back at it. We're unanimously into it. And uh, so everything's going really well. Um, as far as the most difficult thing the group has been through, these guys, I mean, like <laughs> this particular configuration <laughs> of four people has been pretty awesome, to be honest. Like, I don't think we've had too many difficult times yet. Um, but the group has gone through some growing pains. Like Clocks of Motion has been around since 2011. We've had a complete turnover of personnel. I'm the only original member at this point, uh, for a variety of personal and professional reasons. Like people just didn't stick with it for, uh, for the long haul, but like this group of four people, like this is the group of people that we moved into the new rehearsal space that we have, and we've invested in a lot of instruments together as a group. Um, so I would just say it's it's just general growing pains, right? It's like finding the right people, finding the right repertoire, finding the way to the the right schedule that that works for the group. So um, more of a general thing. I mean, I could go into specifics, but 
you know, I guess use your imagination, right? <laughs> so, um, well, I think that that is amplified also because, you know, earlier we were talking about how we all live in different places, and that comes with, what comes with that is that we all have very different other professional lives. So the organization, um, you know, it, it gets it gets tricky balancing. Like we don't want to shortchange something else in our other professional life to do this and vice versa. Um, so I guess to kind of tie that into Tania's question is, um, you know, I, I think for me, it's, it's a real constant um, and diligent focus on scheduling and, and just being as aware and coherent about that as much as I can with my in my personal life as well with my partner, I have to, you know, we have to communicate very clearly about our schedules because otherwise, mm -hmm. otherwise we get too far away from uh, the, the healthy, <laughs> healthy way of, of, of making all this balance. Um, so I think communicating and just being real, real consistent with schedule work. And to jump off that, Matthew, uh, you know, I, I think that, something that the, the balance is something that as a group that's we we knew this was going to be long distance um we we all kind of you know as sean mentioned earlier we actually all talked about this like when we were thinking you know moving forward with the group we sat down and we had like we have an an unofficial official ensemble agreement about you know how what we bring to the table the you know the communication that we expect all of us to have like the type of you know dedication to the projects we're going to do. And I think that that's, that's really actually provided us with a great balance. Like we don't, you know, we're just open and honest, like, hey, this can't work now, we can do it here. And then when we are together, we're fully committed to the music making that we're, make, that we're doing. And that just makes everything else that much more enjoyable because we're not, there's no conflict uh, with, within the individual and within the group. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, so as far as that, like uh, the scheduling thing is like, we sometimes we have a year out schedule a lot of like, we, you know, it doesn't happen in six months and we have to do that. Like we've, I remember in a meeting we would have, we do Skype, you know, Skype meetings every couple of weeks, um, just to kind of keep it, you know, keep us all in the loop, keep us informed progress, all that stuff. But, you know, we really will talk about, yeah, okay, so what's your calendar look like in April of 2019? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, it, I know that when, we're, when we were younger, I'm sure that that would be like, well, I have nothing going on. I have no idea what's happening. But, like, for a lot of us now, it's, you know, that's it comes along much quicker than we all think, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's that's been critical for the survival of this group so far. Yeah, I think that's really important. It, it, that's very critical for the survival because – that's when we can actually put our sink our claws in some, into some time to be together. Is if we're uh -huh, if we're right. really proactive about like what's happening a year or a year and a half from now. Otherwise, it, it gets away from us. Yeah, yeah. And just this going to sound like a broken record, but the scheduling mm -hmm. that is definitely the worst. <laughs> <thing. laughs> Especially not just the sync that what we're going through, but everything else other than products we have in our lives, our personal mm -hmm. lives. It's like. Whenever we do a tour for this residency, we have a couple performances, master classes, but also we do need rehearsal time ahead of that. We can't just yeah. right. put it all together. It's, we don't have the luxury of rehearsing <laughs> one piece for three months every single day. Mm -hmm. So the preparation when you're not with this group happens weeks, months beforehand. Yeah. And this uh, this concert coming up is it was been pretty nice because we have a lot of pieces we played before, but. Also, there, that, with that comes a challenge because we don't want to just put it on stage and have it sound exactly the same as it did last year. Right? Uh -huh. Well, those weren't bad performances. They were phenomenal, and uh, we've got a lot of good recordings, but we're all musicians. We're artists. We want to go deeper, and it's always the kind of a how much brain power we're we'll bringing to the table every single day for eight, ten hours of rehearsal. Yeah. You know? There, maybe that's the hardest thing. Is sometimes <laughs> these, these rehearsals get to be 12 hours long. You're like, well, we, we don't do it today. We're not going to get around to it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's how, how can we make these pieces unique? Not just from clocks, but clocks in April, clocks in September. How right. can these performances be better? 
Ooh, I kind of like that. It's like an album title, Clocks in April. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Oh, yeah. gosh. I like that. So, so you guys moved in. To, Sean, you mentioned you moved into a new studio space. Yeah, that's right. Uh, how, I'm just curious, I'm always curious with, with groups, especially long distance groups that have studio space, like how do you manage that? How do you make that work? Do you use it for other purposes when you're not together? Because that must be such an integral part of you guys being able to make this work is also having instruments and having rehearsal space once you are able to get together. So how, how did you go about getting rehearsal space and you know how do you fund that? So there's some history there, of course. Uh, Clocks in Motion, we, so we became an official group in 2011. Every member of the group at that time was currently a student at University of Wisconsin-Madison. We were sort of an extension of the graduate percussion ensemble there. I see. And so we were using the school for basically our rehearsal space and our rehearsal facility. Mm -hmm. Fast forward several years, we had all graduated, but the school had given us an extra year of a residency to like stay there and use the facilities. Super cool. Um, which was amazing. I mean, yeah. Props to Anthony DeSanza, Professor DeSanza there, who like saw the vision and like helped us through that like kind of growing pain period. Um, I knew throughout that period that we needed to move, like we needed to move on and get a new space. But the the personnel that we had at the time, like the, the performers weren't ready to make a commitment like that. And it was kind of falling on an individual's shoulders. So I was really hesitant to kind of make a move. Uh, but then, then we ended up kind of changing some people around and shifting around. We were actually rehearsing in somebody's house for six months. Is that what it was? Like about six months we were rehearsing <laughs> in somebody's house here locally in yeah. Madison. Yeah. yeah, maybe even less than that. And during that period, I went and I shopped around for rehearsal space, and I got really lucky. I found an old pizza parlor in Wanakee. Uh, actually, it wasn't the restaurant itself. They, they made frozen pizzas and, and shipped them out. Um, and... They were getting rid of their space. It's a 1,400 square foot facility. They had like a walk-in freezer and everything. We got it, the whole thing gutted out. We re-drywalled it and everything. And uh, the rent is really cheap and it's just like a commercial space. So there's no, there's no residences around. So like we can rehearse day or night. I can practice, I can put all my stuff in there. Um, as far as the use of the space, I don't use it nearly as much as I should. You know, I got the space really for this group. And me personally, as a percussionist right now, like I'm here, I mean, I didn't do a lot musically this last year besides for this group, but like, you know, projects come up and I do it and think about doing some solo projects. So this past year, what I did was I rented out the space to three other rock bands in town and mm -hmm. they they pay part of the rent to offset it. Mm -hmm. And they keep a minimal amount of gear. There's like a couple of drum sets there. And the, so the space is being used three times a week by them. Uh, Clocks pays a share of the rent. And then I pay the rest of it. And that's that's kind of how it works mm -hmm. right now. That's the business model. So does that make some questions? Cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm always just curious. Thanks for sharing that. It's it's complicated. Like it really is yeah. hard to find a place where you can make noise anytime. And uh, but I got right. really lucky. I mean, I, I only really shopped around for about two weeks mm -hmm. this place and I was like, okay, that's it. I gotta I gotta do this. It's not gonna get any better. So yeah. yeah. Well also not even just the place where you where you all were moving out of Madison, but the instruments too. Yeah. You know, having a university yeah. setting to back you up and supply that, and then all That's of a right. sudden you have to. Yeah, we buy Cortales. Yeah, we bit the bullet. I mean, we bit the bullet, took out a huge instrument loan, and bought mm. a ton of stuff, you know, like stuff that you just take for, for granted. Like, oh, I don't own Tabales, you know, like, okay, I gotta get those. I gotta get. Yeah. You know, I just, like, when you're in a percussion quartet, you have a ton of stuff. Like, it's just a ton of right. gear. You know, I own six things because I built them, but I didn't own a concert bass drum. Sure. You know? right. so, okay, got it. expensive. You know, like it's just all this these these little purchases that add up. You're like, oh, there goes ten grand. You know, so it's like, but you have to, you know, if if our group was going to go past the student capability, we had to invest beyond just you know our own individual sticks. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Right. My my middle school punk rock band, we had a band fund. It's like, all right, everybody put a dollar in the jar and the yes. idea was okay, if a bass <laughs> string breaks, it comes out of the band fund, but we'd end up just, you know, you buy a PlayStation game instead and <laughs> blow it all yeah. in booze. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, the dollar. <laughs> Yeah, or like, oh man, Tommy, Tommy bought something for his girlfriend. Like, dude, we told you we're gonna kick you out of the band if you do that. 
<laughs> I think another thing that's important and something that we all kind of wanted to talk about too is, uh, you know, not just the performance projects that we have going on, which are great. And, you know, we, we're setting up residencies and trying to do shows and clubs in, in nearby towns and do master classes in high schools and stuff like that. But, um, it's also good for the group that we have sort of more longer term projects in terms of uh, new repertoire, um, some of our own interests, and uh, something that we've had cooking for a little while and has actually now just sort of started the bar yeah, the ball, ball rolling. And actually, yeah, we, we haven't really talked about this publicly yet. So this is an app per percussion uh, podcast, uh, you know, exclusive. 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 <laughs> um, it's uh, so we have a, 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 a collaboration with a composer um, that we've called uh, Clock Shop, and essentially the idea is, you know, there's been a lot of uh, various formats of how we, you know, groups will engage with composers, whether it's a call for scores, whether it's like a traditional uh, commissioning project, consortiums, um, but something that we felt really strongly about was. We wanted to have a more intimate relationship with a composer over a course of multiple years. So we did some vetting and some talking and, you know, uh, discussing and we, we interviewed uh, uh, a variety of uh, composers that we all knew. And uh, we ended up, uh, we, you know, we could only we really could only do, you know, work with one person at, right now. So we uh, we ended up working uh, with uh, Jennifer Beller. And we have a, a three-year project where we're going to get four new quartets, and cool. we're going to work with her, you know, and try to develop, uh, you know, not just, you know, mallets, but try to do, like, maybe a mallet quartet, a drum quartet, or just other sound quartet, and just, just a we, you know, because you do one project with one composer, and you're like, oh, wait, this could be really cool if we had another way to, like, a continue to develop. And uh, and so we're really, really, really excited. And that actually just started. We have material from her um, that we got before we came here. So we're going to get together, I think, tomorrow, and we're going to dive in, video record it, record it, uh, audio record it, and, um, you know, send it to her and just do this back and forth. And, you know, as almost like she's a fifth member of our ensemble for the next three years. That's way cool. Yeah, what yeah, a great idea. The awesome. idea yeah, that came up was like, you know, we think about historically, like Haydn yeah. got a chance to write for a string quartet for numerous years and develop and collaborate. Yeah. And we don't get a chance to do that. Yeah, we did a one off project with the composer. So how do we how do we get someone to collaborate and grow, make us grow as performers, but they can grow as a composer as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we think it's a lot when one composer has written like four to six pieces for percussion ensemble. We're like, oh yeah, that person's a percussion composer. Right. But like, Haydn wrote 104 symphonies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he like kind of got it right in the last six, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. I'm just kidding. I actually really like Haydn, but, um, but, you know, so we just want, we want, and this is kind of a, a first round of it, of the clock shop, you know? Right. I would love to have like a decade with somebody. Yeah. You know, where you can really, where you can really jump in. But, you know, as launching it, like financially and kind of where we were and like doing this kind of first run, it's still, it's still a big, we'll still have a, a pretty big output of music uh, from, from Jen. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, we'll see where the project takes us. Maybe we could have overlapping projects over the years too. So, um, yeah. Very cool. That's, that's super <laughs> yeah. cool. And, you know, we talk about technology. Um, and, and long distance ensembles. And, and I think less often we're talking about technology and long distance composer relationships, but that's also happening all the time too. And I think that's even even easier, you know, whereas, you know, like you said, Haydn was living on, you know, on compounds with these musicians and working with them on, you know, probably a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can almost do that with composers sending revisions back and forth. And like you said, you guys getting together, videotaping stuff, sending it to her, you know, and having having able to have a conversation back and forth without even seeing each other in person. Cause she, so Jen's at UNLV now? Is that Correct. right? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, yeah. And, and, you know, we have the long term goal of, you know, uh, we're going to premiere, you know, all these works over the course of, you know, um, 
in a couple shows where we plan on recording them. And, you know, so it's not just, uh, you know, for Jen, we're, it's, it's, we're getting pieces and we're getting to like, have like very like specific conversations about instruments and all of these things, you know, as you know, we don't have to explain to the audience of, uh, you know, how much it goes into all the instruments and mallet choices and every other, you know, the minutia we can really dive into. But for her, she also gets that experience and gets to, you know, uh, include an even further, uh, even, uh, you know, a bigger depth of her knowledge of percussion. We get pieces. So there's a very back and forth. And we really wanted that to be uh, an important aspect, like the communication and being able to collaborate was really something that we've we wanted to make a focus of the project for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's such a cool idea, and it seems like it's really quite mutually beneficial, like right. to you guys and to her. And so, I mean, I'm I'm curious: is there like, do you guys have any type of financial investment in that relationship? Yeah, that's we do. Yeah. Um, Band fund. So here's, here's the thing. Um, it was really important. It was really important to me, given my experiences, positive and negative, of commissioning pieces that we weren't paying her for pieces; that we were paying her for time. So the so the idea is that every six months, as long as the contract that we signed together is in good standing, she will get paid a a, a set amount of money. Uh, so we're not delivering payment upon. For delivering a 10 minute piece it's just no this is a three-year agreement every six months we're going to send you this amount of money as long as the contract is in good standing and the contract is loose because you know we're talking about yes is the long-term goal of getting this number of pieces but we also we put things in there like we have to be regularly communicating and we have to this is what we're going to provide you this is what we're expecting you to provide us and uh you know so it's, it is a back and forth and we're going to learn from this first experience but you know i just i don't like the idea of like paying for a product and that product is something that's kind of artistic you know it seems kind of it seems kind of almost cheap in the thing like i'm going to pay you per minute of music it's like it, for this project to seem better to model it off of like a residency type thing like what chris said you're a fifth member of our ensemble therefore we're going to we're going to treat you like that um and uh this is just for the duration it's just a good idea because every time you look up like commission models or you know the the union scale commission model or anything it's like paid per page or per measure or per yeah. time and so, we all know that can vary so much like oh so i'm getting paid for adding three bars rest under this model but under that you know like i don't know it seems like yeah this is a good idea what you're suggesting it's 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 something that I think what uh, a great one of the the great things about when we were talking about this is all of us as individuals have been a part of commissioning projects or working with composers in school or in a variety of you know of other ways. So when we drafted this contract, you know, we we really made it a point to make sure that we had some very defined expectations and like we knew we wanted to pay uh, the composer. We knew that like. Uh, we just didn't, we, we, we kept, we, I mean, we discussed various models and like, we really hashed out a lot of these specific things because it is a creative, you know, you know, creativity, you can't just put a deadline on it needs to be done here because we didn't want to like get a piece that, you know, she felt was, you know, had to be finished by such and such a date. So there's, there's terminology in, in, in our contract that, that stipulates this and, you know, it, it, so for as much as all the specifics are there, like as Sean said, it's a beta test, and you know uh, we're 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 in the infancy of it. So uh, it it will we'll report back in three years, let you know how it goes. <laughs> well, it's it's it's, it's for it's, itself on some level. Right. Like hopefully, yes. people will hear the music and they'll say, "Wow, that's something special. I haven't heard anything like that before." I mean, obviously, the the important thing is that we end up with some music, or like a body of work that we're proud of, right? And that yeah. and that Jen has hopefully learned something by working with the same group of professional musicians for a number of years. Um, like you know, Steve Reich working with his ensemble, right? It's that it's that type of it's that type of model. It's like no, these are my people. Like these are my people. They're gonna they're gonna do their best to make my idea come to life. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and, and there's some real value. And I think as chamber musicians, we kind of know that instinctively, right? It's like if if I play with the same group of people for five years, it's it's very different from like every year switching people around. You know, you just the familiarity and just like the lack of. Uh, we were just talking about this in the car the other day, Chris. It's like yeah. the idea of of like really uh, deep seated or like beneath, like just beneath the surface, like passive aggression. You know, where you're like you're in a situation and like you're a little bit nervous and you're, you know, I, I don't know. Like I hope they like the piece or I hope I hope the guys in the room they kind of like how I'm playing. Like I'm not quite sure. Like that after a number of years of playing with the right people, like you don't have that kind of tension anymore. Like maybe by the time like piece number three or four rolls around from the same composer, they're not worried about whether or not we're going to like anything. Right. They kind of already know what we like. Yeah. And, they, and they, they already know what they like. And they've learned something from the first two pieces, you know. So that's the dream. It reminds me, you know, you said getting to a deeper level with the composer. It And you mentioned Steve Reich. It reminds me of our interview with Zoltan Rotz from Amadinda in Taiwan, he talks mm. a lot about, as he does, he talked with us, but he also talks a lot about uh, just in his classes and things, but working working on a long-term basis with Steve Rice, John Cage, and Ligeti. And yeah. yeah, just the amount of depth he has to say about those guys is, is just fantastic. It's information that you can't find on the freaking internet. It's amazing, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, so I, even even if you don't, you know, even if the body of repertoire you generate from it, if people can't tell, oh, it's really different and this is a special case, at least like you and her will have that depth about each other, you know, because I mean, obviously this conversation goes on and on and on. And if you guys want to hear that, Zoltan Rotz, uh, to our listeners, that's episode 98. Right. I'd like to listen to that. That sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, he just knows a lot about about oh, those yeah. guys. You know, he just really, really knows a lot about those guys. I did something. You know, I was uh, listening to uh, you know what we're ex uh, bringing out here with this new project, um, and I want to also mention that part of the inspiration maybe was that um, we've all kind of been involved in some of these commissioning consortium projects or just premier projects from composers where there's just a part of that project that like really did not meet some standards that should have. Um, and, and that's something that we're hoping will kind of grow out of this and, 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 and be more, an example maybe to more composers um, new, uh, of new music and, and working currently. Um, you know, where in the contract we've we've been pretty clear about how the quality of the parts and the scores and and then the, how and like what Laurel was saying, the mutually beneficial thing between the group. It's it's a two way street. We're working with you and you're working with us, and we want this to go back and forth. So uh, I think that was in a lot, maybe some of the inspiration because yes. we've all yes. had those experiences mm -hmm. where. Like, I can't read this part. Why did you give it to me? Or yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. Even, get parts from it. Yeah, yeah, or we've been handed scores to play a, mm -hmm. a percussion quartet piece, and yeah, with seventy percent negative space, you know, or yeah. like the the print is like this big, and there's like a huge like two inch gap between every staff, you know. Oh, there's enough rest yeah. of speech in my forty five so, Yeah, or so, like, hey man, the marimba doesn't have that note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the yeah. published yeah. version of mechanical ballet that we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, today. Uh, today. Yeah. That A doesn't exist, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> so this reminds me of there's a great story uh, of Gary Green, who was he's now retired, but he was the director of bands at University of Miami. I think it was like 1987. He commissioned David Mislanka to write a symphony. I think it was Symphony Number no. One. And so, you know, he, he gets a grant for, I think it was $13,500 or something like that for the symphony. And he's all excited and he gets it all worked out with Mislanka and Mislanka writes the symphony and he sends him the score. And Gary Green says, hey, David, like, got the score, looks great. Where are the parts? <laughs> <laughs> ah. And he said that, oh, that he didn't include the parts. So Green had to, he said it took him eight months by hand. He wrote out every single part for the symphony. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh! Yeah, that's that's a line item in the uh, yeah. in the contract. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow! 
what do you got there, Laurel? Well, it's a bit of a change of topic, but I was looking at your all's website and it says you've got a podcast coming up. Yeah. <laughs> it has been a three year work in progress yeah. so far. Yeah. Yeah. It's because it's hard, man. It's hard. Yeah. It's because it's freaking hard. I don't think that's going to be a, an application exclusive when that's coming out. Yeah, I think that... we already gave you our exclusive information. <laughs> no. <laughs> so it's it's hard to do it. I mean, this format is really cool what you guys are doing, like where it's kind of interview based and and you've got some segments and it, and it really works well. I I don't think we're going to go in that direction. It's not going to be like a directly competitive thing, but it, it'll be more it'll be more like uh, it'll be a little bit more talk radio y, you know, where it's just. It, I don't think we're going to be really doing interviews. We'll probably be kind of. We might. You don't know. Yeah, may, I mean, maybe it's a chance. But, yes, you have a guess. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. possibly. You know, so. Um, I have, I have a banter thing going on here, so we might. Uh, yeah, I mean, really, the inspiration for some of the podcasts were the you know those conversations that you have as a group late at night, and you know Sean and I are arguing over some really, really you know. We went, you know, deep down that uh, that the hole of abstraction, being like, "Well, no, you're wrong. No, no, let's let's record this and make a podcast out of yeah. it." Right. And so that's sort of like the inspiration behind it. But uh, you know, Chris doesn't understand the magic of Charles Warren's music yet. And I'm just uh, trying to get him right. to see the light. Thanks. So. You know what? I wasn't going to go there today, Sean. But you know what? <laughs> I I could get it. I could I could fight about this. I'm into this. Yeah, we could. We could wait, wait. Whose side are you on? You know, no, no. Well, it's. It's tough because, like, spinoff, yeah, violin, bass, congas, amazing. Janissary music, ah. Oh. Now you see, now you see, I play Janissary music. I, careful, uh, Casey. Careful, Casey. And it's really hard. That's all. I'm I know it's say. hard, and well, that's part of the that's part of the problem. Yeah. That's part of the problem. It's really hard, and it's like, ah. Uh, uh. I mean, spinoff is really hard too, but damn, it's cool. Well, you know, we recorded the percussion quartet with uh, the group in 2014. Yeah. 2013, yeah. And I think that's a wonderful piece. So I, yeah. I would love to see, I would love to get some more music there from him and we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the quartet. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great piece. Yeah, I, I, I probably just offended everyone. No, no, you didn't. <laughs> no, you didn't. Do. I'm just, you know, I'm. I'm taking the high road here, Casey, and just letting Sean, you know, continue to, you know, it's fine. I'm kind of like the, I'm kind of known as the Bill O'Reilly of percussion podcasting. So oh you should my really God. Just fight. Well, yeah, well, my blood hasn't boiled yet, so I think you're not not quite the Bill O'Reilly level there. Do I have to, do I have to pretend to hate Zanakis? Uh, oh, whoa, 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 Casey. This is good. I think we should move on. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm no. We, sh we should fight, but I'm I'm looking at the clock, thinking, Megan, do you want to get to your topic today? You have something to report on about yeah. the safety of our hearing. Yes. So the music we already know that the music that we make as percussionists uh, can be unhealthy for our ears, either with it being prolonged exposure in a practice room or um, through very loud music, whether that being in a rock band, orchestra, gamelan. Um, so that is not new information. The new information here is actually a legal case. Um, and this is, I found this, I actually heard this on NPR, and now I found a, an article about it, and the title is Royal Opera House Ruling Will Have a Profound Impact on Orchestras. And it's written by Mark Savage, who's a BBC music reporter. And this case is a viola player his name's Christopher Goldscheider, and he made this report because he says that he, was, he suffered hearing loss while playing at the Royal Opera House in 2002. And the piece that he was playing was Wagner du Valkyrie, in, and the noise level was ex had exceeded 130 decibels. So that is roughly equivalent to that of a jet engine. He claims that his hearing was irreversible, da ir irreversibly damaged, and even though he was wearing earplugs, this was very obviously unsafe for him. And he calls it, quote unquote, acoustic shock um, during a rehearsal of Wagner. So, you know, that makes sense completely. What the court has ruled, this was on, in 2002, and what the court ruled just this week on Wednesday, 
was that quote, there was a clear and fact, uh, a clear factual and, ca and causal link, unquote, between the noise levels and the musicians hearing loss and that the company had been in breach of regulations regarding noise at work. And so what they're looking at is looking at uh, factories and regulating noise levels there and requiring employees to wear hearing protection. So they're kind of looking at this in the same way uh, because there haven't been a lot of cases of this yet. So the viola player, Chris, he's saying that he has been forced to give up playing or even listening to music, and he's, he's claiming 750,000 pounds in lost earnings. Wow. Yeah, so the argument here is kind of that this verdict has profound implications on the future of live music. And that's what the British orchestras are saying now and the musicians' unions are saying is how do we deal with, with cases like this in the future and how does this change the way we work as musicians in the orchestras. And the director of the Association of British Orchestras, Mark Pemberton, says, it effectively says an orca orchestral workspace is no different from a, fac from a factor factory. And it says that musicians will need to be wearing their hearing protection at all times. He also said, it has hammered the square peg of these regulations into the run hole of the beautiful music that orchestras and opera companies continue to produce on a regular basis. And when he was asked uh, what the impact would be for concert goers as well as musicians, and he just said that it was too early to say, and that our priority is to find a way in which we can be sure that the great music that our members are putting on is going to continue and be unimpaired. So again, they're kind of having to compare between a factory and an opera house, and those are completely different things. So current regulations that exist um, is that if the Royal Opera House had complied with its statutory duty that the claimant would not have been exposed to the level of noise which it has, she concluded. So the noise at work regulations are the current regulations, and they came into, forth in two, came into force in 2006. And basically what that said is that there's a two-year two delay for music and entertainment industries so that they had more time to draw up specific guidelines for live music. So this really just hasn't happened yet for orchestras. It, yeah, the, health and safety, the health and safety executive said, a health and safety executive said, quote, the loudest pieces may be played less often. And that's referring to, to Wagner's to Wagner's works, but they are still going to perform the rig cycle. It will still be a part of what we do in orchestras. But perhaps the orchestra said that perhaps maybe they will program things less often or that the schedule would give the musicians time to recover um, and that this would maybe be kind of flagged as physically demanding work. So it's interesting, and obviously it needs to be discussed more and there needs to be more rules, other things that are that can be considered would be putting up noise protection between the brass section and the string section or between the percussionist and the string section. And um, this particular person, Chris, the violist, he had been positioned directly in front of the 18 strong brass section in a cramped orchestra pit. So of course, like <laughs> I, that makes sense that these decibel levels could get up to that loud. Mm -hmm. So the, the very first sentence of this article says, Musicians could be required to wear earplugs, quote, at all times, unquote, following a landmark ruling on hearing loss. So I'm curious, what do you what do you all think about this? And, you know, in teaching percussionists oh. and working with percussionists, you know, there's what's so your much here? Yeah, there's there's so much. And I think, well, ben, yes, ben, I think that it could be re regulated. And I think that, you know, what seems to be in our community is just to be smart yeah. about it. And for, for there to be a lot of education on hearing loss, which, you know, Vic First has done a lot of that, and I know other companies have too, but research on hearing loss and then, you know, educational outreach and telling people about these things and, and, and providing earplugs and, you know, just being really smart about it. So that seems to be the way that our community has dealt with it. But what do you guys think of this in the context of a big orchestra? Ben, I think you're first. Well, I just wanted to say, I, I remember a while back I heard this, and I don't know if it's true, and I have no quote for it or anything like that, but I've heard that actually classical musicians suffer from hearing loss more, like, you know, greater severity and more often than uh, commercial, like, rock musicians. 
because rock musicians are always playing with like in-ear monitors and like very like heavily you know muffled out sound yeah. whereas classical musicians yeah you just go on stage with your violin and you know leave with it tonight kinda, every single night but like it kind of reads like uh the classic hot coffee i burnt i spilled mcdonald's hot coffee yeah, I mean, well, i think, it's, right. McDonald's. I think like, it's i think it's a personal choice i think that it's a responsibility definitely <gasps> educational institutions but also you know halls and things like that to advertise to their musicians the importance of wearing earplugs um, yeah. it's not a life and death thing. So I don't think it's so much like a, you know, a construction work site where you have to wear a hard hat or something like that. But I do think it's important for it to be at least knowledge and you can make the choice to protect your hearing or not. That's, that's what I think too. I mean, it, yeah, it does come off as a trivial case when you read it. Cause I mean, first of all, I, you see musicians all the time wearing earplugs in orchestras, especially if they're behind percu- in front of the percussion or in front of the brass. Yeah. Like this poor guy, you know, I mean, I, I imagine people are just saying like, dude, like, duh, like where no one told you you couldn't wear earplugs. Well, he <laughs> was wearing earplugs. Oh, I missed that. Holy crap. He was wearing yeah. earplugs. Oh. Yeah, he said that he was wearing earplugs. Jeez. So, I mean, maybe he wasn't wearing good enough earplugs, but also it sounds like he was just like right in front of like the position was just, you know. Uh, you, you know, know we're, we're having to talk yeah. about composers minutes ago and what they ask you to do and this is a little tangential but i mean i i I do get annoyed when composers are like oh yeah just we just want like the loudest loudest percussion something something oh yeah that's so cool loud is so cool it's like yeah loud is cool but it's also like wagner it was impressive then i mean i know it's impressive for instrumentalists to do and singers to do now that's still impressive but aesthetically it's not impressive anymore like we have the rock concert now you know like i don't think we need to care about that as much anymore i mean it used to you know like you don't get overwhelmed i i imagine you don't get overwhelmed with volume today the way you may have back then like wagner might have been the loudest thing you would have heard then but dude go to a rock concert it's like like loud is not hard to achieve is my point and i know it's hard to achieve on a horn i know it's hard to achieve on percussion and instrument i know it's hard to perform but like musically it's not a rare thing anymore so i just i get annoyed when people are like oh yeah loud it's sweet you know Mm -hmm. well in the case of this guy i mean you know it's 16 years later like Wait, and you're saying you're hearing losses because of this one project 16 years ago? But maybe it took that long to get the case through? I don't know. That's you a know, good point. Based on what Megan but said, it, yeah, it's like, it, it like just it was... ignores the fact that, like, oh, you spent all this time playing this instrument that's, like, 10 inches from your ear. Well, based on what Megan said, it did sound like this was the, the legal proceedings took this long. It wasn't. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. maybe you should just... <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't play Wagner anymore. But I do know, like, when we when we had Brian Zader on here, he talked about, like, for a drumline re- rehearsals, if his students show up without earplugs, he won't let them mm. play. Like, they, it's required for that, which, I mean, for that activity, especially if you're inside, that's, that's just a, a must. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I think in a professional orchestra, if you want to blow out your hearing and, you know, ruin your career because of that, then don't wear earplugs. It's your own choice. Yeah. So, but, but what about this thing they're saying, like like factory workers, they are going to require musicians to wear earplugs. I know, you know, I, I wear earplugs as much as I, I can, but sometimes it's really distracting and I feel like, oh, I just can't quite hear like I want to for this yeah, setting, I, you know, and I, I take them out. I think mm-hmm. uh, I think we would have some something to add to that too. I mean, we're we're all wearing earplugs in almost all our rehearsals, right? A low ceiling, yeah. Space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I feel like we're probably on a path. Well, I also feel like the orchestra should provide these, and especially these in in certain situations, these um, upper level opera orchestras that are turning over lots of rep. I feel like it should be the orchestra that's providing like a. A good quality yeah. ear um, yeah. earplug. That is really expensive. Yeah, it's just another yeah. for musicians. Um, yeah, especially the unions are going to require it. Well, I mean, it's the technology has vastly improved from stuffing toilet paper in your ears, you know, and you know the sort of you know there there are a lot of uh, advances, and you know, like I wear earplugs that are specifically molded. 
and have filters and so that I don't have a loss of of that that sound, that interaction with the sound that I hear from, you know, these guys and that I can hear myself versus like the the foam earplugs that just sort of like block. So, yeah. you know, in, in terms of uh, how as a community we're going to deal with that, you know, I, I think it's it's going to be, you know, important because you know, we're, we're at this stage where we have all this research now and we're, we're more evolved than we were, uh, you know, in terms of this knowledge from years ago. And I mean, we all know teachers or, or other pedagogues at, at schools or colleagues that we, and they, they, you know, their hearing starts to go and like, they just, you know, and it, we just don't want to, you know, we don't want to see that happen for ourselves. So I think we just have to, we kind of have to engage with that. And, yeah. You know, as the technology gets better, the expense will come down, and it will be much more uh, manageable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure there's much more to this case. I mean, even having Megan read it aloud, I missed a detail that oh, he was wearing earplugs. But <laughs> as these case silly cases that appear silly often turn out not to be, and actually the McDonald's hot coffee one, it's like the common uh, frivolous lawsuit that people always bring up. But if you look into it, they're like the um, yeah, it's like way more legit than than it sounds because they they do make their coffee with like the specific brewing process that makes it way hotter than your regular drip coffee. Yeah. And um, I just I mean, this sounds like a public health thing. It's like, how do we feel about seatbelt laws? You know? Yeah. Like, did we have laws that you have to wear seatbelts? Well, is it your right to drive in your car unsafely? Like, right. I, you know what I mean? It's like right. It, you're not endangering anybody but yourself, but at the same time, like we know that seatbelt laws reduce traffic deaths. Right. Like we know that requiring musicians to wear earplugs would reduce hearing loss. Right. Right. Would there still be people that break the rule? Yeah, but that shouldn't be a reason, I think, to like not make the rule, maybe. It's know. like on the lines of drinking or smoking, yeah. though. It's like we know that that, that harms you, but it, yeah, isn't going to be the way a car wreck would. At what point are we infringing upon human choice and what you would like to do with your freedom? You know, I mean, if, if that's if you just don't want to wear earplugs, but you want to be a professional musician, then, you know, you run that risk. But I also don't think that it, uh, you know, uh, you know, how we how we balance out the variety of, you know, situations which music happens like I can't I mean, I've been in a pit for a full opera and I mean, it is unbelievably just oh yeah. Like, even with just the strings playing, you know. So in that context, in that situation, yeah, I mean, you should be have yeah, having to wear earplugs. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, if you're in a, if I'm in a big space and I'm recording marimba, I'm probably not going to wear earplugs because I don't, you know, I I feel more connected mm -hmm. to the sound and I don't feel it's as harsh, even though scientifically it might be, you know. So would I would I need to be wearing it, you know? Uh, right. At that point, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I remember doing Madam Butterfly. There's some big gongs towards the end. There was an offstage cannon, and and it was a matter of like getting everyone's attention. Be like, hey, here it comes. Get ready, and then wham, you know. And I don't know. It's like a way we all got along. Well, this whole conversation I can tell is making Laurel need a beer. So I think we should. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> But you guys, thanks so much. Clocks in motion. You guys are just, it's awesome to chat with you guys and and see you all. And yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Nice snag, Megan. Yeah, it was so great to have all you guys and meet all of you. And good luck with your tour this week. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, Absolutely. so everyone check out Clocks in Motion online. They have a great website, lots of material, articles, videos, audio, Lots of really good stuff. You can find them. So, okay, everybody, thanks so much. We'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.